Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from BearMarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your sex life and your marriage. And I have an amazing interview coming up with Lauren Rose from Call to Peace Ministries. And, you know, when I've done these interviews in the past of women's stories who were in abusive marriages and then they found freedom in Christ and they just underwent so many horrible things, especially with the Gothard cult. People have really resonated. They're some of my most listened to podcasts and you are going to want to listen to this interview. It is just awesome. So I'm so pleased she could join us. But before we get to her, I need to talk about something that's been going on since our podcast two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, Jay Stringer and I were analyzing a clip from a sermon that megachurch pastor Josh Howerton gave. Josh Howerton is the senior pastor of Lake Point Church in Rockwall, Texas, near Dallas. It's an SBC church, megachurch with, I believe, seven sites. And he opened his a sermon in, back in February with a two-minute anecdote, which he framed as a golden nugget of marriage advice, which summarized the marriage night that they had just had in church. And Jay Stringer and I talked about it. It was, it was really problematic. Howerton told women that on his wedding night, so on the husband's wedding night, women were supposed to stand where he tells you to stand, wear what he tells you to wear, and do what he tells you to do. And Jay and I talked about why that was problematic as well as why other things that that Howerton said was problematic. Well, (laughs) I shared that clip on social media and it went totally viral, seen by, you know, over 2 million people over all of my platforms. It's been covered in the news on Salon.com and the Dallas and Houston papers in several Christian papers and, and big news sites. And people were just really revolted, which made me super happy. It's 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 one of the few times that I have seen the internet erupt in absolute disgust at the same things that we've been calling out for years. So, you know, when, when I think about the things that have encouraged me <laughs> in the past two years, because we've done several podcasts on how discouraged I feel, it was the fact that people got it. Like when they saw him say that, and they understood, yeah, this is what Sheila's been talking about. This is why she wrote The Great Sex Rescue, because these messages are so ingrained in our culture. But what I really want to talk about is what happened after that. Because Josh Howerton put out a statement saying that we had taken him out of context, that it was just a joke. But he never said it was a joke. He said it was a golden nugget of marriage advice. And he never said So don't do this. Now don't try this at home. Now, obviously, we're just laughing about it. No, he said that and everybody laughed. And then he went on with his sermon about something totally different. The context doesn't make it any better. And the thing about a joke, if if you want to call it that, is that it's only funny if people agree with the underlying premise. And the underlying premise there is that women don't like sex and that women are obligated to act like sex blow-up dolls while their husbands act like porn directors. It's a pornified way of seeing sex. It is not a biblical way of seeing sex. And we know from our research in The Great Sex Rescue that these types of messages that Josh gave are one of the huge reasons why evangelical women suffer from two, two to two and a half times the rate of sexual pain disorders as the general population. That's what the obligation sex message does. We know that doing the wedding night this way is one of the reasons, again, that women have higher rates of sexual pain disorders. We know that these things are also linked to lower orgasm rates. And so this matters. This has real world effects. And that's the point that we have been trying to make over and over again for years is that our words matter. And even if the women in his congregation laughed, even if they believed those underlying assumptions, it doesn't mean that they're not being harmed by it. This is what we found in our research, is that when you believe that these things are true, it has effects on your body. So even if the women laughed, it still can definitely have an effect. Last Sunday, Josh Howerton issued an apology of sorts at his church. He began this apology by railing against me, not by name, but again, saying that I had taken him out of context and that I hadn't said that it was a joke and that he frequently just jokes. But then he did say, if you were hurt, he apologized because he shouldn't have hurt you, which, okay, but a real apology looks like this. I know that what I said caused harm to people and what I said was wrong. 
What I said normalized the pornified style of relating. It normalized seeing women as obligated to have sex with their husbands. It normalized men being sex, crazy sex monsters while women don't want sex. It normalized the idea that men don't have to do anything for the wedding, but can leave all of the mental load and labor to her. All they have to do is show up. It normalized really harmful gender dynamics. And as a pastor, I should not have done that. And I am now going to take some time to listen and to learn and to pray about this because I made a misstep that hurt people and that, that hurt the cause of Christ in the eyes of the world. And I am sorry for that. That's not what we heard. Instead, he spent the rest of the sermon explaining that Jesus offended people. And so we should expect pastors to also offend people. And that that is the way that Josh operates is he tells jokes that people find offensive because that way people enjoy the church service and they aren't bored. I'm going to put a link to the sermon so that you can see the whole thing um, and a link to a Twitter thread I did where you can see just part of it. But I want to focus in on a couple of the arguments he made, and then we'll get to our interview, because I think this is important. Here's the big thing. Josh Howerton failed to note in that apology sermon that Jesus offended because he was fighting injustice, not because he was perpetuating it. In that sermon, Josh says that Jesus called people lots of bad names, like a dog. He called Gentiles dogs. He called other people broods of vipers. And so, you know, if Jesus used this kind of hyperbolic language and if Jesus was rude, then it should be obvious that pastors might do that as well. And we shouldn't we shouldn't think that that's necessarily bad. But let's zero in on what actually happened in these two instances that Josh is naming. The calling Gentiles dogs comes from the story of the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 18, verses 21 to 28. And it, it's a little bit unclear what Jesus is actually saying. There's some debate about how the word that Jesus used was more like puppy. And I don't want to go into all that. What I want to go into is the result of that conversation. Because after that, this woman asserts her desire to be part of the blessing, to be included in what Jesus is doing, to receive a miracle. And even though she was from a racial group that was generally excluded and she was a woman, Jesus praises her to the skies for wanting to be included and he elevates her and he grants her her request. And so in the end, after this encounter, a member of a marginalized group was given full equality and inclusion rather than excluded. What did Josh do in his sermon, though? He took a group that was often abused, women, and he told a joke giving golden nuggets of marriage advice that further objectified and marginalized women, not that included them or lifted them up. Now, what about the brood of vipers? Jesus called out the Pharisees using this term, as well as whitewashed tombs, lots of other things, the religious teachers, because they were acting unjustly. They were excluding people from God's blessings. They were piling burdens and not lifting a finger to help them. And in both cases, Jesus was pleading the case of the marginalized and trying to stop people from being excluded. He was stopping injustice. Jesus offended power structures. Josh offends when he reinforces those same power structures. Josh asked us to laugh at women being pornified. Jesus called out the people objectifying women. Both Jesus and Josh offended people, but one did it to free them and the other did it to further oppress them. Josh then went on to say that there are people who are actually offended on behalf of others who aren't even being offended and that this is terrible. He treats this as if it's a bad thing for people to be offended on behalf of others who may not even mind. And yeah, I just want to say very clearly that yes, Josh, I am offended. I'm offended on behalf of the women in your congregation, even if they laughed, because I know what effect hearing these sorts of things for years has on women. We have studied it. We've seen higher rates of sexual pain, lower orgasm rates, and higher rates of abuse. To be offended on behalf of those who are being oppressed, even if you are not being oppressed yourself, is part of fulfilling Jesus' calling to set the captives free. It's part of being his hands and feet in the world. In this sermon, Josh consistently uses Jesus as a comparison to himself. He talks about how Jesus was often taken out of context and how the demonic cancel mob came after him because of that. But Jesus was acting for exactly the opposite motives and aims as what Josh was in his sermon. Jesus did not offend to make the gospel seem cool. Jesus offended because he was fighting injustice. 
I hope that Josh goes back and reads the Gospels again and really looks at why Jesus offended people and looks at who it was that Jesus actually called out. Because if Josh humbles himself, he may see himself in those stories, but it won't be as the Jesus character. And I hope that the pastors who have been really hounding me on social media about this, and it's really been only been pastors and men from Lake Point, that's about it, who have been trying to defend Josh. I hope they do some introspection too, because it is about time that the men in evangelicalism, and especially the pastors, start realizing that women are not the punchline of your pornified joke. And I just wanted to say that. So thank you, everybody, for encouraging me by helping this thing go viral and by seeing along with me how horrible this was. Please keep speaking out, though, because it's going to be a long fight, but people are seeing it. And that's what's important. And now I want to turn to Lauren Rose, who is a product of this kind of teaching in the church. And let's see how it affected her. Well, I'm thrilled to welcome on the podcast today someone who just has such a great heart for what we do because she's in a very similar work. So this is Lauren Rose from Call to Peace Ministries. Hi, I'm so happy to be here today. We are grateful for your work as well. So it's fun to be here. Yeah, and I've done I've done a lot of podcasts for you, and I've met you before on your side of things, and now you're coming to my side of things. But before we start in with your story, tell us what Call to Peace is. Yes, so Call to Peace exists to provide a compassionate, comprehensive, Christ-centered response to those impacted by domestic abuse. We provide advocacy support, support groups, and practical assistance, and we also help churches and other organizations learn how to better respond to those impacted by domestic abuse. Yeah, so that's great. So you do so much like advocacy and education work too, as well as really coming alongside victims. And yeah, I'm really, I I really appreciate your work. But I, I know when I was on a podcast with you a while ago, you were telling me a little bit about your story. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like my my listeners need to hear this because there's so many similarities to what I hear every day. So can you tell us like how you got sucked in to really negative relationship dynamics and abuse. And that started even as a kid, didn't it? It started more as a teenager, more so. But yes, I, well, my family became Christians when I was 12. And so from there, I was homeschooled. And then we joined the Bill Gothard program when I was almost 17 years old. So before then, I was kind of a normal teenager, you know, going through normal struggles and everything like that. And then I entered into this world. I was like, this is a cult. I want nothing to do with this, like absolutely nothing. But in that world, if you respond like that, you're father shamed and you're told that you're rebellious. And I actually met Bill Gothard when I was 17. And I learned that girls weren't allowed to be educated. We weren't allowed to have friends. We weren't allowed to listen to anything other than classical hymns. And I was like, this is, I, I, I'm like so mad. I'm like, this man is ruining my life. Like I'm going to get education. I'm going to be successful. I don't want anything to do with this. So I met him and mm-hmm. I, it's just like, could tell he was just so excited, thought he was going to win me over. And he was like, yeah, so how would you, what do you want to do with your life? You know, how would you like to work with troubled youth? And I said, oh no, I'm going, and I named the school. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. And he's like, well, what are you going to get? I said, well, I'm getting my degree in business management. And this is what I told him what I'm going to do. And he looked at me and he's like, well, how would you like to go here and be able to really be successful? And he names what I can do. And I'm like, no. And I was like, nothing to do with him. So he actually announced on the stage that evening in front of 20,000 people that I was the most hard-hearted, rebellious individual he had ever met. More hard-hearted. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. So I was very shamed and made to feel horrible that I wanted nothing to do with this program. I thought the education was horrible. I was like, I don't understand how reading Matthew 5 through 7 is an education. I was like, this is, this is not education. This is, you're, you're Mm -hmm. making me study the Bible. Like this is going to mess me up getting into college and I was like, so I saved money. And I was like, I'm going to college and I'm out. Like, so that was kind of my heart. And I was like, wow. not any, wanted nothing to do with it. You know, something funny too is when he met me at 17, the other thing he said with that is that I was the type of girl that would destroy his whole program. And like, he just did not like me at all. Like, since a lot of defiance. So mm-hmm. I became- well, he was right. <laughs> I was a very strong-willed kid and I was like, I'm going to tell you like it is and I want nothing to do with this. Like, and if you put me in here, I was like, my attitude is I will literally destroy you. Like nothing to do with this. So I became a Christian at 17 and really started, I loved the Lord and really wanted to know him. 
And I be we went to a conference and I began to believe that it was put more pressure on me that I had to go into this program to be a godly Christian. And if I wasn't going into this program, I no longer love Jesus. So I wanted to be, I felt like God was calling me into the mission field and I wanted to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. I had a really radical change and started to get to know God and was still wanting nothing to do with IBLP, but I was told, no, you need to go here first because you'll be a better Christian. And so I gave up my college education acceptance and went right into the IBLP program at 18 years old. Oh, did you really? Oh, that's so yeah. sad. Yeah. yeah. And for those of you who are listening, remember IBLP, that's shiny, happy people. So if you saw the documentary, shiny, happy people, that's what we're talking about. So yeah, it was not, it was, I was in a program for six weeks where I had to like, I was really brainwashed. I had to listen to their teachings every single day. I could only talk to my parents 15 minutes a day was not allowed, not allowed any outside influences and was really, really shamed. I actually met another person you interviewed, Elisa Welch. Her mm -hmm. parents, or no, not parents, her parents and laws were mm -hmm. there. And yeah, they made me feel like I was a really horrible person and began to carry a lot of shame in my life. And they made me feel really afraid of the world and afraid mm -hmm. of men. And somehow that if I didn't follow all their programs, I was going to marry a really abusive man I was into porn and that I was just going to be not precious. And it was just, I, I walked away feeling so low and I bought into their program in order to find my identity and worth. And I am gung ho. So I went all out. I mm -hmm. back to their second phase of their program that you also had to be isolated from the world for five weeks and then went into their college. They have a Bible college. And so I got my degree in their Bible college and biblical counseling and had planned to be a missionary in Romania. So yeah, that was, I got very brainwashed into it, went gung-ho into it and just was searching for value and worth after really being beat down and made to feel that I was worth nothing unless I did all of their principles and did everything right. And nobody would want me in marriage unless I did everything they said. Right. And people think this is fringe. And I mean, IBLP was fringe, but the thing is the people that got into it, got into it from normal churches, you know, because friends were going to it or, you know, like it was, it was all in all throughout churches. Like we had people in our homeschooling group in my town, like that my kids grew up with who were in IBLP. So it, it you know, like, like I know friends who were in it. So it seems fringe, but it, it, if you were in evangelical circles, it was actually quite common. <laughs> Yes. And you get sucked in very slowly. Like we still went mm -hmm. to a normal church in the beginning and then you get so sucked in, you can't even attend a normal church anymore. Most of them yeah. did home church or end up going to an ATI church because you no longer could even fit in with normal Christians. Like mm -hmm. you, it was just, you were hymns, you were long skirts, you were courtship and you were no youth group. And anybody who believes in youth group was very secular worldly. So we were very sheltered, very secluded. So you get sucked in very slowly. And then eventually, before you know it, you you're isolated from the whole entire world. Right. OK, so you take it. You're taking a biblical counseling course. And yeah. looking back, what do you think of what you were taught? Oh, goodness. Well, I read a lot of the Pearls books. I read a lot of the Ezo's books. I did take Law 101 and 102 from a book, College of Law, and I loved it, which I'll talk about later, which was actually instrumental in when I faced both author in court. I took a medical course. It was very interesting, but everything was very, like, from the Bible. I did take some theology courses, and I hired a tutor from the seminary, local Southeastern Seminary, Bible Seminary, and I got education there. So that was good, but it was a lot of studying their material. I studied literally their financial seminar, their basic seminar, their advanced. I have done their counseling seminar. I studied every piece of material ever written by them and wrote mm -hmm. on it. So I memorized all of it and then had to write how I made it applicable to my life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, it was, I, I would say it further shifted my my mental thinking to be very brainwashed as this is the right way to to go. Like you don't really know anything else at this point. Like this is all you're learning. Mm -hmm. This is all you're breathing in. You have your own language, your own way of communicating in the Christian community. Yeah. And it's all about you need to follow our exact rules or else you're not under the umbrella of protection and Satan can get at you. So it's not it's not it's not really Christian. It's not about Jesus. It's not about living out with the Holy Spirit. It really is just about following these rules. 
Yes. Yeah. And it just makes you feel like it's a fear-based or like mm -hmm. if you don't do these things, Satan will destroy you. If you don't do this, then this is how you're going to end up in marriage. If you don't do this, this is how your friends are going to make you be destroyed and the pain you're going to have in your life and the suffering. So it was, it was called the a true success to life is basically what their motto was, a new approach and great to true success. And so it was basically like avoiding suffering. Like he even retold the story of Job. Like he says that Job actually, is, he was punished because his children cursed God. And the reason why his children cursed God is because Job wasn't a very involved father. So there's always, oh, and Joseph was the reason why he was put in the pit is because he was bragging. So there's always an explanation to why these people suffer because they did something wrong. So any suffering, like cancer, anything is all your fault. Everything is on you. If you do these things, you will have success. There's no divorce. There's no mm -hmm. suffering. There's no infertility. You don't walk through these things. You are getting good health you know, through their health program, they have this, and like they're literally taking control to avoid any aspect of suffering. And so it's, right. when you're young, it puts a lot of fear in you to think of, oh, wow, if I do these things, I'm gonna be destroyed. You don't have enough life experience to even understand it. So I, yeah, so that's, that would be my kind of view of that. Right, right. Okay, so then after the counseling program, how soon after that before you met the guy that you were gonna marry? Before we get to that, though, I want to thank our sponsor. We have such an exciting sponsor for this podcast, the Kingdom Girls Bible from Zondervan. It's an NIV Bible. It's supposedly for girls, like ages 8 to 12 or even teen girls. But honestly, we started talking about this in our patron group, and so many of the adult women have gotten it. I can't tell you how excited I am about this Bible. First of all, it is absolutely beautiful. The illustrations are lovely. But the main thing about it is that whenever a woman is mentioned in the Bible, there's a full page spread on her with wonderfully racially sensitive diagrams and the stories of these women. So girls, when they read the Bible, they're going to see themselves included in it. Like just think about the power of that for your daughters. So check out the Kingdom Girls Bible. The link is in the podcast notes where you can get it and see more and see the beautiful illustrations. It's just incredible. And of course, we also want to thank our patrons who do so much to support the work. They give as little as $5 a month, but they can give more than that too. And that lets us do what we're doing as well. They get to join our amazing Facebook group and get unfiltered podcasts and more. And so you can join as well. That link is also in the podcast notes. Or if you want to give more to some of the big research things that we're doing and some of the big things that we're doing to get into peer-reviewed journals, if you're in the US, you can get tax deductible receipts through the Good Fruit Faith Initiative of the Bosco Foundation. And so again, check that out. Well, so that's, well, I guess I'll get further into my story, but I guess kind of part of that is I really started, I, like I say, became a Christian at 17 and God like kept me through this, mm -hmm. which I think is really amazing. Like I'm seeing all these things, but at the same time, my spirit is ringing out. Something's not right. Like it was a lot of frustration over this stuff. And I, this like, world that felt like it was conflicting with each other um, and so i don't describe it any other way than the holy spirit was starting to speak to me something's wrong like this isn't right but yet i'm being told something's wrong with me to even feel this way so i begin to suppress my cautions and suppress anything the holy spirit is saying to me because i can't fully live it all out without hearing the holy spirit and then i began spending an hour in prayer every day it was like what god told me to do and i don't regret that i actually really happy i did that and so i began seeking God and in in experiencing God in this time and like really getting to know his heart. And part of my story is I had blocked memories from a childhood sexual assault, really horrific events, went into four stage trauma, dissociation amnesia, and blocked it from my mind. And like through prayer and fasting, like the Lord's like brought it to my mind. And then the Lord's like, I'm ready for you to know you got to go fast and pray. And so I fasted and prayed and I was like, okay, God, I'm ready for this. And so I had my first flashback and started to deal with this. Nobody believed me. Nobody understands this. And counseling is considered horrible in this organization, like horrible. It will destroy you. You're not allowed to get any counseling outside of these people. Like, don't, don't go that way. So I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. I had to spend my whole entire time in prayer. That's how I learned to work through these horrific flashbacks that was terrible. I had PTS and I literally spent hours in prayer every day just trying to figure out and letting the Lord speak truth and bring healing to my heart and life. So I began to know God's heart. I began to believe and know that he is good 
and he's loving and kind. And so I was very conflicted in things, but, and that's kind of what happened there. And so I met Bill Gothard. I, okay. So I was sitting at a conference and we go to this yearly conference and it's like, I don't know, 5,000 people now at this point, it's no longer 20,000 because we're doing in four different separate all over the nation. And I'm sitting there and he's talking about the remaining government and I wanted to be a missionary. And I just felt like God was speaking to my heart and saying, I want you to work with them. I was like, okay, God, if it's really your will for me to work with them, why don't you make Bill Gothard come find me and ask me? Because if it's your will, you can move heaven and earth, make it happen. So randomly I see him and my sister's saying hello to him. I think he scouted out my sister. I walk up to him and I say, hi, I'm Lauren. It's nice to meet you. And he said, and he just says, hello. And he starts staring at me and he said, how would you like to come work with the remaining government? And mm. I was like, I, I would, I would like to go. So that's how I ended up with Bill Gothard is I, that whole incident. And then I worked for him and he really took a liking to me from the very beginning. And he would basically, he started asking us for stories and testimonies. And I loved talking and I'm like, he's like, does anybody have a testimony on this? And I'm like, oh yeah commands of Christ. I'm like, raise my hand. I've studied all his material inside and out. I can tell you a story of how I placed my life for every area like he mm -hmm. talks about. And so he started noticing those things and he's like, oh my goodness. So he pulls me aside and he's like, I'm extremely impressed with you. I want you to stay here and I want you to be actually my assistant. He's like, I want this mm -hmm. to be our ministry. This is no longer my ministry. And I'm like, oh, wow. She's like considered elite of elite. Like when you're selected by him like that, like I'm, I'm like, I must be worth something. I really must be worth something because I felt like I was worth nothing still compared to this organization that beat me down all the time with legalism. And so he asked me to pray together and I prayed with him and we get up, he looks at me and he's like, I can tell you really know God. When you pray, I felt the Holy Spirit come and I felt like you just touched heaven. Like I felt like I was at God's throne. I was like, well, yeah, I do know God. I walk through deep, hard things in my life and I, I, I know him. I walk with God. He's like, you remind me of an old staff girl. And I haven't had this much fellowship with a girl in a long, long time. And I was like, who is she? And he went, tell me her name. And he said, she's from the 90s, you wouldn't know her. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay. And he's like, well, she and I had fellowship together. And I just never had that fellowship with anybody else since. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And and for context here, Bill yeah. Gothard is not married. And at this point, you were how old? Yeah. I was 21 and he was 72. 21, 72. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he invites me to ride up in his little blue car, which is a big deal, and hands me a opened letter and says, read this. And I start to read it. And it was from a girl. And I was like, something inside of me screamed. It's the Holy Spirit. I was like, this is inappropriate. I was like, something's going on between this man and the woman. And I don't know what it is. I was like, but something is wrong. So I looked at him and I said, do you want me to rip this letter to shreds for you? And he's like, no, and he takes it and he snatches it out my hand. And before he did though, I looked at the back and I see that name and it says Meg. And I was like, Meg, 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 who's Meg? So two days later, I'm in his office again and I'm watching him flirt with all these young girls. He flirts with them, he delights in them. And I'm screaming out, this is wrong. This is not okay. And I say, God, I don't know what is going on here. Whoa, what's happening? And I hear the Lord speak to me in my heart. And God says, I've seen everything here. And someday I'll use you in court to testify against him. And I was like, what? So I just mm -hmm. hid that in my heart. I then confessed to Bill Gothard that I'm actually a childhood sexual survivor. At that point, he decides I can go home, that I no longer remind him of this old staff girl and is going to send me home. But I end up staying. And he decides he's going to do counseling with me over sexual abuse. And it was horrific, horrific. Mm -hmm. He told me I sinned against God when I was sexually abused and made me get down on my knees and confess my sin and being abused. He like would spread his legs and make me tell details of my story. But in my spirit, I sensed that he was lusting after me. I was like, this isn't right. Like he's lusting after me. And like he would say to me as I'm sensing that because I'm guessing he can tell I'm sensing this and I'm uncomfortable. And he's like, you know, you should never tell de people details of these stories, but the way you heal is by telling details. He's like, see, mm -hmm. I don't have, I don't, he's told me, he's a he is not triggered by them. Like he doesn't think bad thoughts and he can handle it. He's like, because I've never had sex with a woman. And because of that, I don't ever have sexual thoughts. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, and it gets terrible. He tells me the reason I feel pain in my heart 
is because I am, because remember that believe in suffering, is because it means I have not made a list of gratefulness. So I have to make a list of 10 benefits of being abused as a child. I told that I was had a worldly mindset because I was more concerned with the things of the world. And that's why the pain hurt. If I didn't I had a spiritual mindset that it wouldn't hurt to be in my heart to remember these things, but because a spiritual mindset would say that I am so focused on Christ and what he's given me through that, I wouldn't feel pain. Now, so, I want I want to just pause yeah. here for a minute because this is horrific what God, Gothard said to you. And this is over the top. Mm -hmm. But I have also heard so many pastoral and biblical counselors saying similar things to women. Oh, it's terrible. Not, it not maybe to this level, but to say the reason that you can't get over what happened is because, you know, you, you don't have a grateful spirit. It's because, you know, you haven't fully forgiven. It's because you're carrying bitterness around. Like the problem is always on you. The problem, mm -hmm. the reason that you're still upset is because there's something wrong with you. So even though Gothard was like over the top, this is very common when people go to unlicensed counseling. Yes, absolutely. It's because they can't deal with suffering and they don't have an accurate per mm -hmm. perception of yeah. suffering. And it's wrong because it denies the fact that we live in a fallen world and there is physiological effects on a, of going through abuse. It does hurt our heart because we weren't designed to live in this world. It does hurt mm -hmm. you that you are human. And it's actually, I love Rebecca Davis. One of her books that she uses and uh, teaches mm -hmm. false teachings is about how that we were accused of bitterness when actually Job and everybody else cried and wept too. Even Jesus wept. It's mm -hmm. normal to sit in suffering and feel pain. That's part of finding Jesus. And we as Christians want to wipe out pain and say, oh no, you can't feel pain from that. You should be over it. You should, if you're a strong Christian, you won't feel pain still from your divorce you'll be moved on. Like what's wrong with you? Just bless them and move on. Now you shove it down. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I'm going to get there, but it will destroy your life. It will, because you have to feel the pain. You have to walk through suffering to get over it and to grieve it all out and to move forward in healing and wholeness. And if you don't, you will stay stuck in a, in a horrific mindset. So it, it drove me to believe that all pain and suffering is my fault. I'm Bill Gothard got worse. I stopped counseling with him because one night he grabbed me, pulled me under his suit jacket and tried to kiss me. I froze in my tracks, backed out. I was like, I'm out of here. And I thought because I'm taught this man's godly and because that horrific book, which one is it? It's the one that tells us we're all every man's battle. I read that mm -hmm. in 19. I thought that I was responsible for tempting a godly man and I felt horrific. So I left and prayed all that night. And I said, God, I see you take away this pain. I prayed for like four hours and I just felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, the pain is gone. And I never felt pain in my heart again. And I don't believe that's God's way of always healing people. But I was stuck in a situation. I didn't know how, I was trapped here. I made a two-year vow to stay at headquarters because he told me to make vows and God would destroy the work in my hands if I leave. So I've made my vow to God to stay here for two years. So I'm trapped. If I don't get rid of this pain and can't function, then I'm just going to be destroyed. So he's going to punish me. He has ways of punishing you and sending you to the mail room and all this type of stuff. So God healed me and I moved forward. But the psychological damage of that remained in my life for years too. Wow. Uh, yeah. Then I met my now then husband there. And at this point, I'm so brainwashed by principles. And I just start feeling caution that this isn't God's person for me. And I start seeing evidences of things that I'm like, this isn't going to be good. Like this is indicating there's less issues. This is indicating that when this man is upset and doesn't get his way, he's going to yell at me and get angry. Like I just started seeing all these things and I was like, well, I have to end this. And so I tried. And then I was basically told that I need to follow biblical principles. And that's why I have anxiety and fear. And if I just let go of my anxiety and fear and follow all these principles, I'll be successful in marriage. Like I've been taught that there's no suffering coming from me. If I do all the right things. And who's, and who's teaching you this while you're seeing these red flags from this guy? Is it the guy telling you this or is it just the community that you're in? Or? The guy, the community, everything. Like, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. my whole culture, my world that I live in. Like, that's how we live. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in suffering. We believe in just suppressing it all and doing all the right things. And God will bless you and reward you. As long as I have my parents blessing and do everything they say, the Bible promises it'll go well for me. So and did your parents know him? They saw him and they didn't see the red flags. 
No, they didn't. I mean, I, I told him, but no. Hmm. So I, you don't believe in long courtships. Um, you get married very quickly. So by the time I was engaged, I only seen him got together six times. So yeah, it was a quick hmm. courtship, got married very quickly and began noticing something was wrong immediately. But at this point, divorce is not an option. Like, not at all. Like you, I, I, it's just not, and I don't even understand the word abuse or anything that's happening in my home, but in our organization, we were taught submission and to obey in all things, all things at all times. So when I didn't do what that person said, I was threatened, like physically threatened, called vulgar names. Yeah. Like sex is, you never say no, no matter if you're recovering from childbirth, no matter what, like that's not an option. And then I would have scripture read to me to tell me that it's my fault. And I just don't love God. And it's always my fault. And that I just don't love God enough. And my heart is dying inside. And I I just literally want to die. Like, I don't want to live in this anymore. It's so horrifically painful. And I'm like, how come there's so much pain in my life if I've done everything right? Why is this so painful? Like, and I'm not going through details of the abuse, but it was basically about power and control. Like, everything had to be about them being the upper person and they controlled every aspect of my life. They had the final say. I had no voice. I wasn't allowed to work outside the home. I mean, I wasn't even allowed to volunteer really outside the home without his permission. You know, everything is control, friends, everything. And there's punishment given if you don't do the right things. I'm like Googling, I'm like, Mm help for my marriage and i find the domestic violence and power and control will and i'm like well every single one of these things are in my life and in my marriage Mm -hmm. like all of them are there i was like but they're supposed to be controlled i was taught by bill gothard that sometimes your authority may slap you across the face as a way to punish you and you were a chisel like you were he was a hammer and i was the diamond is what i was taught and so he's basically beating me not physically but i i've been through physical abuse but to bring out the character of Christ in me. So I'm thinking as a good Christian, I'm supposed to just take this and let God conform me to the image of Christ. And I did for about three years. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore, God. I, I just can't, I wanna die. I was like, I'm, I'm ready to just die. Like I, I'm done, nobody will believe me. I, I don't even know what to do. Like, it, this is not normal. And so that's when my face just, I just fell on the floor, I remember. I'm like just crying out to Jesus. And I was like, Jesus, just help me. I don't, I don't know what to do. And the Lord, like God spoke to me again. And and God said to me, go to recoveringgrace.org. I was like, okay, that's weird. I don't like this site. And there was part one of Meg's story. Remember Meg, the girl mm-hmm. that he told me I remind him of? He asked to marry her when she was 21 and he was 62. So I got in touch with her. I said, get me in touch with that girl. I was like, I know her. I've read her letters. I know who this girl is. And at that point, I knew within me everything I had heard, like all that caution was true because all that caution I felt towards my husband and my marriage was true. Everything I felt about Bill Gothard and seeing him flirt with young girls was true. I wasn't a just rebellious, defiant, messed up individual. Maybe it was, I saw the truth and I no longer can remain silent anymore. It just screamed out so loudly. It was either like death or life. I was like, I'm going to die if I continue to suppress all this. I can't live in this anymore. So Megan and I connected along mm-hmm. with several others. And she's like, you gotta get in therapy. You gotta get therapy right now. And so I went to therapy just to deal with the sexual abuse memories that of Bill Gothard counseling me. And that's all mm-hmm. I deal with, dealt with. I was like, Bill Gothard never abused me. I walked in there. I was like only a male counselor this in his 70s. I'm like, because I'm very against therapy. And I'm like, he had had a, he's his MDiv. And I was like, okay, I'll be okay. Because at this point, I don't like, Bill Gothard told me a therapist would have ruined me and actually asked me to thank my parents for never getting me therapy. So I I was very afraid, but I walked in and I was like, I'm desperate for healing. So I'm here. But I was like, Bill Gothard abused me. We're just going to talk about what he did to me in counseling. And so we started unraveling that. And after six months of unraveling that, it was just like all of a sudden the light bulbs went off and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm being sexually abused to my marriage. Sexual mm-hmm. abuse is occurring. Like, and I don't have these exact words. I just describe an incident. And he's like, you never told me. He's like, these things happen in your marriage. I was like, I never knew they were wrong. Mm-hmm. But if what Bill Gother did to me and said to me is wrong, then these things are wrong. And he's like, well, what's the truth? And I was like, my marriage is abusive. I was like, but I have to save it. Like, I can't, divorce isn't an option. Um, So I was like, I'm gonna save it. 
am going to do everything I can and I'm going to save and fix this. I can't do this to my, my child. And so, yeah, I worked through that. I began doing a lot more therapy and doing a lot more work along the lines of being sexually abused, my marriage, and just processing through that because Bill Gothard taught me in my brain that I'm responsible for all this. So when my husband abuses me, I believe I'm responsible. I'm responsible for a man's lust. I'm never to say no. I, I'm supposed to be available whenever they want. Like if I don't know any difference, it's written on my heart that's not supposed to be this way because it's not God's design. But I don't have words to say this is wrong because scripture and all these Christian teachings are telling me this is right. Something's wrong with you. But mm -hmm. essentially you're so miserable inside. You're like, I can't live in this anymore. And so I just kept doing that. In the meantime, I joined the lawsuit against Bill Gothard, who was Jane Doe number four. And then I ended up leaving my marriage. Finally, I showed up at my counselor's office with a bruise and I was like, I went to my medical doctor and I'm like, I'm done. Like I need help. And my church at this point had me in marriage counseling. I was still trying to save the marriage because I said I wanted to save the marriage and he's not even repentant. It, it's just like, it's all justified and it's like escalating. And I'm like, I can't. And so my therapist at the time puts me in touch with Joy. Like he sh we're in Wake Forest where she lives. And I was like, Joy Forrest, the founder and executive director of Cult Peace, is who I met. And so I went into her teeny tiny office and I showed she I told her what's happening and she showed me the power and control will. And I'm like, but these things are supposed to be controlled by God and by your authorities. She's like, no, they're not. Not in a Christian marriage. Not at all. Like, and she starts taking scripture and showing me God's heart and, and God's heart for marriage. And she starts validating that what I've been through is abuse and that. I'm living in fear and that these things are not okay. And she's believing me. And she's like asking me questions about it. And I was like, for the first time, I was like, I finally feel like somebody who believes me and I have words to say, this is abuse and this is not okay. Like this is not God's heart. And according to scripture, these things shouldn't be happening. So I got in touch, she got in touch with my church and she met with my pastors and began explaining to them abuse. My therapist met with them and they're like, this is abuse. We're getting her out of here. So they got me out of my marriage and helped me the get to the safety. church, the church or the, oh, good. Okay. Yes. And so my pastor said to me, he's like, I know men have abused you in life, but I want you to know that not all men are abusive and desire to hurt you. And we as a church are going to stand by you and walk with you and keep you safe. And I was like, wow in that moment i really felt the mercy and love of god and i was like it's it was amazing because i would have never even left unless my church told me to i didn't know how to listen to anything unless authority told me to do so and so i then the lawsuit was dropped under complications and then i had a judgment put on me it was after i left or sanctions put on me excuse me of two hundred twenty thousand dollars by gothard i testified against him in court and then i went home and filed for divorce a week later so then I began working for a call to peace, but it's been a long journey. We can untangle all yes. of that, but it's, that's yes. kind of the story of coming to a place of freedom after such abuse and just being told this is God's heart. It was really challenging walking through all this because I was like, there's certain points, even though I knew God, I was like, I don't think I want to be a Christian. I was like, if this is Christianity, I don't want anything to do with this. Why does God give us license to men to abuse women? Why did God even create something so horrible as marriage? Like, why did God create men? Like, I started asking and questioning those things. And it's through people and men that were good, that spoke truth to my life, like the pastor, and through Joy saying, you know, this is not God's heart. Like, Jesus was put on the cross by religious people. Religious people destroyed and killed Jesus. It wasn't the sinners out there. It was the Pharisees yeah. and the Sadducees slew him. So he understands suffering. And he understands being portrayed, portrayed by those who profess to know God, but live nothing of it behind closed doors. And so it was like, I was like, okay, God, I'm going to cling to you. And so through that, finding his heart and finding that Jesus understood, he understood what it feels like to be betrayed by those who use the word of God to suppress you and to control you and use it as a sword to literally slay you. And so, I mean, that's what they did to Jesus. They used the word of God against him. And so you're, it's been a journey of me for finding God's heart. And I appreciate your book so much because it's so rooted in scripture and so rooted in God's heart and so much of our teachings, like 
Bill Gothard Seminar, I think 2.5 million people been through it, mostly counselors and Christian um, leaders and things like that and pastors. And so, so many people have taken on these views and that created such amazing, wonderful young people. I was that shining star on the stage all the time, giving my testimony and telling about these things, but they never thought where this would end up in life for me. Like eventually it destroyed me because that's I not- I think they knew. I think they knew and they didn't care. They didn't care. Those men didn't care either. They just sat there yeah. in the lot with their tails tucked under them and refused to say anything. They didn't. Yeah. And they just watched it all happen. But yeah, so many, yeah, Christian teachings, people just don't evaluate them and look at them and say, where does this leave women? What is God's mm-hmm. heart for women? What is God's heart for marriage? Instead of looking at the truth of scripture and what God really meant. Because God's a God of love. And nothing should make us feel oppressed and like we hate God because yeah. of his word. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Just, just for our listeners, we had Emily from Thriving Forward on last year, a year and a half ago about the Bill Gothard lawsuit too. So I will link to that podcast so you can listen more to her story about being involved in that lawsuit. But that was thrown out because of statute of limitations, wasn't it? No, it was, oh, okay. it was other complications due to the lawsuit. So this, it wasn't okay. statute of limitations. It was a, it was a very complicated thing. And so we withdrew. It was a lot. A lot was happening. A lot was going on inside stuff with the lawyers or just like, hey, this man's going to, it's going to be a really rough ride. And this is how we're viewing things. And so we chose to drop the lawsuit due to complications. And, and then he countersued you. Well, he actually put sanctions on us. So that's, it wasn't a countersuit, but basically if you got the, it was a sanction saying that we had lied. And so he was trying to prove defamation and the $220,000 was to pay him back for his lawyers. So right. he was putting the sanctions, sanctions demanding that we pay him back. And so there was like 18 of us in the lawsuit, but he chose seven of us for the number of perfection. So he went after seven of us in the lawsuit to yeah to have us testify in court. And then that was, Emily said that was a very healing experience, was testifying in court. And it, it was. For me, I was very traumatized. I'll be honest. Like, I was, like, tapping like this before I went up there. Emily went right before me. I was, she was Jane Doe number three. I was Jane Doe number four. So the Jane Doe's went first. Mm-hmm. And then that's when the, the Oprah College of Law courses I took came into handy because I started using all of those methods I learned in there hit my mind on this witness stand. And I was like, oh yeah, this is how you do this. So it was interesting because his representative was a a legal defense attorney and was really vicious and he wasn't prepared. And like, he kept saying things. And then I remember he said something and he thought he was going to hook me. And then Mm -hmm. I remember the part in the lawsuit where he says, enlist sympathy because show that he doesn't understand it and tell your life story. He asked me, do you really believe this is sexual abuse? Do you understand sexual abuse? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh boy, you've got, you've got, I've got you. Because I said, yes, sir, I do. I was like, I'm a childhood sexual abuse survivor. So I know darn well what sexual abuse is. I was Mm -hmm. like, this was sexual abuse by Bill Gothard because it was unwanted and unconsented. So therefore, by the very definition, I'm like, it is abuse. So like he was asking me things like that and then trying to hook me in and other stuff along the lines of saying that I was trying to expose Bill Gotham for the lawsuit. And I was like, and it was like, but wait, he would catch stuff that was off guard. And I'm like, there was one point where he was like, I found this in a private support group. And so you said this. So therefore you're trying to expose him. I was like, in that private support group, do I ever state who I am in my name? And he, I was like, and does that statement say that? And he was like reading it again. I was like, no, sir. I was like, how about you answer me? I was like, does that statement state that? And then he kept going at me. I was like, does it state it? Read it. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. the judge had him read it. And mm-hmm. that point, the, the, he got so mad, he started yelling at the judge. And then the mm-hmm. judge threatened to end the whole thing. So it was great. I mean, <laughs> I was like, this is interesting. I was very nerve wracking. I was like, this guy is not prepared. And so basically I just tried to, show that I knew what I was talking about and was prepared and trying to make him look dumb because he was. Yeah. I, knew I had the truth and I knew the truth is stronger than a lie. And so yeah. in that moment, I just feel like the Holy Spirit hit me and I was like, I'm prepared to fight like whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So at the end, I felt good because I felt like I stood for others. I yeah. stood for what was right. 
I, I had two people back in my mind. Actually, one was Alyssa Welch and another person I'm not going to name. And I knew them and I was like, they've experienced the worst of it. So I got to fight for them and I have to fight for my daughter because she's not growing up in this environment. I was like, I'm going to fight and I'm going to fight you with everything I have. So every time he started coming at me, that's when I was like, okay, it's my turn to go back at you. So <laughs> yeah, at the end, I felt good. And I was like, I went to Bill Gothard's office the next day or looked in and I saw the boxes all over there and I was like, yeah, this is what God means when he says, I've seen everything and someday I'll use you in court to testify against him. The Lord is good. The Lord has seen. And yeah, it took 10 years, almost, yeah, 10 years to get there. But God mm -hmm. saw, he had a plan the whole time to expose this and to show the truth. Like, and so my heart is to show God's heart that this is not him. This is not mm -hmm. God at all. Yeah. And you guys did not have to pay Bill Gothard anything no. either. Just no, wanted to make he, that clear. Yeah. No, he had, he peeled us like four times. We had to hire an it lawyer. But yeah, it was, then it was going to go to the Supreme Court of Justice in Washington, D.C. was the next level. And that's when he dropped it and decided right. to be done. So he fought for a long time. I, yeah. 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 All right. Well, I will put a link to our podcast with Alyssa as well. So both with Emily and Alyssa, so you can hear their yeah. stories, our listeners. So today you're divorced. Yes. And you're raising your, your child by yourself and you, you're you finding this new God that you always knew, but you could never quite understand and things that you knew in your heart didn't measure up with what was being taught to you. And now, now you've found this freedom and you're involved in this organization that helps others. And I, I, I want to give our listeners an insight into some of the commonalities of the stories that you hear. You know, because you're involved in Called to Peace. And so you talk to, to abuse victims all the time. Mm -hmm. And so many of them come in and they're confused like you were. They were like, I didn't realize this was abuse. I was taught I was just supposed to submit. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us how the teachings that are so common in church are really, really keeping women trapped? Right. Well, it's basically, I feel like always we're taught to look within ourselves and to never question anybody else and to never really think like, and so much we're taught too, is that to be really afraid of separation. And I'm not divorced gung ho and telling people that they need to do that, but we're so afraid of that this is such a bad thing or that it's gonna destroy our family that we won't even consider that. Or we, yeah, it, I think a lot of that happens. And so we're very afraid and we feel like we have to stick with this. We have to endure it. And I feel like a lot of people, when they do finally reach out for help, they're told, given a longer to-do list, like have more sex, pray more, go fast, try to be kinder, you know, have better meals. And so I think it's important to understand that abuse is about power and control. And it's about one person maintaining power and control over the other. And their expectations shift all the time. So one day it may be, you need to have dinner ready at six o'clock. And then, in, or they're all so upset. The next day, it may be, I was coming home early at 5.30 and I didn't want this side and they're upset here. And so it's always shifting and you're always trying to achieve this sense of approval by them, but it's really never enough. And it's never really about being enough because it, to them, it's about power and control. It's them breaking you down. It's them making you think if you could try just a little bit harder, it would be better. Everything is always your fault. I think one thing to understand about abusers is they never take responsibility and accountability. Abusers don't. They may cry and they may say they're going to change, but do they ever mm -hmm. really take accountability for their sins? Do they ever really repent and begin a changed path? No, they don't. They just find new ways to manipulate and new ways to control. And so that's where with Call to Peace, we do offer advocates where it's free of charge. We'll sit down with you in an intake and help you understand the most women that come to us are just confused. They're very confused about the relationship. They don't have words to say. They feel like they're going crazy. They feel like nobody would believe them. They feel all kilter. They feel like they can't stay another day or they're going to die. That's very common. And they're just like, I can't take this pain anymore. Please help me understand I'm just so confused. And usually they live in fear of their partner. That's the most common thing to look for is they're afraid of their partner. They're afraid of disappointing them. They're afraid of not being home on time and what will happen. They're afraid of not having this done right or saying this thing wrong or not pleasing him in this way. It's a constant need to please and a constant fear of not pleasing. And so then we help them walk through the process of understanding, do you stay or do you go? And what does that look like? Because you can't just really you can flee, 
but that you really have to do that very strategically and know what you're doing when you get to safety because it's you have to be prepared for court and all types of things so we just kind of help them practice through that but i would say yeah, a lot of those teachings is they just it makes them feel very confused about themselves like i'm more responsible for my man for my husband's lust I'm responsible for to meet his sexual needs so therefore when i'm not meeting his sexual needs it's okay for him to get angry because this is a normal christian man like no that's not that's not mm -hmm. god's heart that's not god's heart at all and submission if you're a complementarian or egalitarian like should never be used no matter what your beliefs are it is never ever yielded as a weapon to control you it does not mean somebody has the final say and everything about your life when it comes to abuse they don't get to control your finances they don't get to control and isolate you if you can't go to the gym or you can't go see a friend or you can't go out to dinner or do something with your friends like i don't know what like kind of an isolation type thing it's not about controlling everything about the kids and making you feel like a bad parent that's not that's not it that's not christianity either because you're going to use your children as palms they're used as weapons to control you usually in abusive marriage and you're made to feel like usually you're the bad parent or they're very absent it's a it's a stream between the two i guess you know that's not submission it's not about power and control none person one person does not have all the power to tell you what to do in every area of your life that is taking your god-given autonomy from you to be able to follow the holy spirit and being able to be led by him they have stripped that from you and that's not okay that's not does not make god happy and does yeah. not please his heart and i think so many times we've like in churches we've come to believe that and that women are just sex objects and that's not true and yeah, have you ever have you ever seen a marriage where just have more sex actually works no actually an abuser like usually will then demand even more sex like it's it's an like a it's like feeding a bottomless pit with an abuser it's mm -hmm. rooted in entitlement and so everything is about control and they'll be like oh you had sex with me in the morning here but oh you have to have to do it now at the night too and i know women that were having sex with men three times a day and still being abused actually statistics state if you're having sex daily they yes. demand that daily you are more likely in an abusive marriage yeah we found that too that that in general, the more often you have sex, the happier your marriage is until it becomes like daily or almost daily. And then there's a huge drop off because people who are having sex daily, there's something else going on. That's not normal yes. in general, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Someone left a comment on my Facebook page about a friend of theirs. And this friend's been married 40 years. You know, she and her husband teach marriage classes at their church. And one day she was with her friend and they were driving the friend's husband's car just a short distance to go meet them. But they, so she was in her husband's car and it was raining and, and she noticed that the back window was open. And so she told her friend, Hey, you should close the back window. And the friend laughed and said, Oh no, no, I know enough not to ever touch anything of, of Peter's or whatever his name was. Wow. And so yeah. she didn't close the window because, and she was laughing like this was normal. Like you, you like, you know, enough never, ever to touch anything of your husband's. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's like, and, and my, and, and this woman was saying, you know, I was trying to explain to my friend that that isn't normal, mm -hmm. but she just had, she couldn't even understand what I was saying. She just thought, no, this is just the way it is. It's their normal until they begin to question it yeah. and to look inside and say, is this my normal or not? And I think it's really important for, for parents to understand and this is not to make anybody feel guilty or bad, but children who grow up in this type of environment where there's abuse present are more likely to end up in abusive relationships or become abusers themselves. And so mm -hmm. many times we think we're saving our children by staying together. And I'm not advocating over here, please go get divorced. Please don't hear me as saying that. By staying together, it's better for their children. And it's better for them to stay together and to watch their dad abuse their mother tear her down in front of them, you know, rip her to shreds, make her feel like a terrible individual as a, as a wife, as a mother, that's better for the children than going through a divorce. And it's sad because a lot of women we work with find it's absolutely not. The no. children more likely are going to identify with the abuser because children identify with the person with the most power and then begin abusing the mothers themselves as they become teenagers. That is more likely the common pattern or they have nothing to do with them later in life. And they usually yeah. have nothing to do with Christianity because when you live in a home, because children are smart, and this is why I think it's so important for pastors to understand this, because if you don't get it and you don't begin advocating for women in your church, this is a generational cycle. 
Children mm -hmm. who grow up in homes with domestic abuse and their dads sit front row in the church every Sunday and is all involved and they watch their dad abuse their mother behind closed doors. Do you think those children are going to love God when they grow up? No, they're going to want nothing to do with God. Mm -hmm. They're going to want nothing to do with church because they're going to think that God is an abusive person. And so when we don't stand up for this in churches, I think so many times they're so afraid it's going to come out of the woodwork or they're going to destroy marriages or, or whatever. No, when we hold abusers, oppressors accountable, we are stopping the generation cycle of abuse. We are saving families by saving children from mm -hmm. seeing a God that is abusive. I think it's really important to know too, is that it's not best to stay in a relationship that's abusive. And then don't seek marriage counseling either. I'm, and now I'm not saying mm -hmm. don't get marriage counseling when you need it, because marriage counseling is wonderful if you're in a non-abusive marriage. But if you're seeking marriage counseling in an abusive marriage, counseling will be, be used as a weapon against you. Mm -hmm. You will have mm -hmm. to tell all your faults because most marriage counselors are not aware of domestic violence. They're not trained in it. They're not going to be looking for the pattern of power and control over, looking for fear in the relationship. He's going to be like, tell all her faults. And then it's going to be like, now you try this and you do this. And then he's controlling everything you're saying when you go to marriage counseling and you can't say these things. And now it's, I have, most people talk to it gets a lot worse if yeah. you're in abuse and you seek marriage counseling. And so that's where we, we do work really heavily with churches and even starting to work heavily with counselors and offer training to be able to understand the dynamics of abuse. Because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for ministry leaders and people helpers, like counselors, to be aware. But for the most part, they're not. And it's yeah. going to get worse if you try to, to do that. The best thing to do, the best chance to save it is to separate and to begin to hold him accountable for the way he's treating his wife. Yep. Amen. So, Lauren, where can people find Call to Peace? You can go to calltopeace.org. You can request an advocate there, or you can reach out to us on our Facebook page, or you can go to info at calltopeace.org and contact us. And we are happy to talk with any woman that thinks they might be in abuse and help you evaluate if it's a marriage problem or abuse issue. So Awesome. And I will put those links as well as the link to the power and control wheel that Lauren was talking about, because that's very interesting and a very eye-opening. So thank you so much for sharing your story. I, I'm so glad that you're free now and that you're thriving yeah. and that you're able to help others with the help that you received too. I think that's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm grateful for you and your books. They were so healing. I was saying the first time I read your marriage book, The Great Sex Rescue, I like literally started crying because, I mean, I'm single. I've been single for seven, well, six and a half years. But I felt so much relief to hear that, like God's word state, this was not okay. It brought healing to my heart to know that this was never God's heart to endure sexual abuse in marriage. And so I'm really grateful for that because God's truth sets us free. And I'm grateful for your heart in setting others free and seeking to share his truth with other people. And um, so thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad that Lauren could come and share her story with us. It, it's heartbreaking what she went through, but it's also so healing to see how well she's doing now and how when you have a real encounter with the God who sees you, who cares about you, who doesn't see you as the punchline for jokes, how such wonderful healing can happen. And so thank you, Lauren, for joining us again. Call to Peace is in the podcast notes. And I also want to do another shout out for our sponsor, the Kingdom Girls Bible. It honestly is so amazing. I just love how it covers all the different stories of the women in the Bible, some that we might not even know, like the midwives and Exodus. They're some of my favorite characters. You know, it's about time that we paid attention to the women in scripture and realized that just as Jesus doesn't consider women a joke, but included them, it's great to see a Bible that does that too. And this would make such a wonderful gift for your daughters to know that they are important, to know that they are included in the blessing so that maybe in the future they won't end up getting swindled by a pastor who doesn't respect them, but also they won't end up in an abusive marriage because they'll know that they have value and that Jesus cares. So check out the NIV Kingdom Girls Bible and join us again next week on the Bear Marriage Podcast when we celebrate one year of our book, She Deserves Better. It turns a year next week and we've got some fun things coming. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye.